Thank you. So I'm here to tell you that internet level consensus is practical. So we're, we're all used to this idea that if you look in your browser and you go in the security tab, you've loaded up a whole bunch of certificate authorities. And when you go visit uh, an HTTPS website, your browser is going to make sure that the certificate was signed by one of these uh, many CAs that are loaded in your browser. But what if, suppose for a second, you wanted to have something like a certificate that instead of being signed by one of these CAs, uh, had been signed by every single certificate authority in the whole world? Well, the first problem you run into is, uh, what do you mean by all the CAs in the world? Like, what are all the CAs? And so you could say, well, Mozilla publishes this list of 180 some odd uh, root CAs that are owned by 65 or so different organizations. Maybe that's the set of all CAs. But that's not quite right because every different OS distribution tweaks the list of certificate authorities that it, that it ships uh, to their customers. And moreover, a lot of organizations have their own local CAs, right? And these are CAs that aren't globally recognized but that uh, individuals uh, depend on. And so what you really want is you want to make sure that all of these certificate authorities have somehow signed off on whatever this statement is that you want to have signed. So this is an instance of what I'm calling uh, the internet level consensus problem. Now, why would you want to solve internet level consensus? Well, here's kind of a warm up uh, application. Suppose you wanted to have a global timestamp service. Right? Well, as a first approximation, you might look at work that's going on in certificate transparency, which is this kind of this parallel infrastructure to the CAs uh, that provides these secure logs. And so you could maybe say, well, let's generalize certificate transparency and allow people to log arbitrary documents. And then you can go to one of these CT logs and you can get a timestamp on your document by getting it inserted in that log. And the first problem you're going to run into is, OK, fine, but now you have to pick one of these logs to go to. And the problem is that different people might trust different log authorities, right? And at the time you're getting a timestamp on your document, you might not know to whom you need to prove that timestamp later on in the future when you're trying to prove that, you know, you came up with this idea, say. Uh, and so that means that you don't know that the person you're going to want to prove this to, you don't know which log authorities they're going to trust. Now, that's one problem. Another problem is, what if you pick a perfectly reasonable seeming uh, log authority and then in retrospect, people decided that that uh, organization was not very trustworthy, right? So this happens, right? Uh, you know, Google decided that Symantec had in fact, you know, done some bad things and that was in the context of certificate authority. So you can fix that by saying, okay, Symantec will reissue free certificates for their customers or something. But, uh, but that's because certificates are for going forward for new web connections. If you care to go backwards and, and prove history, it becomes harder to correct the problem. On the other hand, if somehow we had internet level consensus, then this wouldn't be a problem, right? Because now all of the log authorities in the world would have agreed that your document appeared at a particular time in this log. And so you could prove that to anybody you want because whatever log authorities they trust, those log authorities will have signed off on the document. Here's another motivation. Last year, there was this controversy when Apple went to the FBI and they uh, when, sorry, the FBI went to Apple and they asked Apple to sign a compromised bootloader for the iPhone because they wanted to, uh, to break into somebody's iPhone. And Apple protested and they said, we won't do this. And they went to court and then, you know, the FBI backed down and suddenly this, this problem seemed to go away. So we don't think that Apple signed this compromised bootloader, but we don't know for sure. There's no way of knowing for sure. Um, on the other hand, if uh, Apple had employed uh, software transparency, uh, there actually would be a way to know for sure whether or not they'd signed a compromised bootloader. So the way this could work is that the iPhones could be configured such that they will install a firmware update only if A, Apple has signed it, and B, that firmware update has been published in some public log that, uh, that everybody can audit, right? And then if we didn't see some new mysterious firmware show up in this log, then we would know that the FBI hadn't installed this, this uh, malicious firmware on somebody's iPhone, right? And, uh, and if you have internet level consensus, that could make these logs much more secure, right? Because now instead of trusting one organization to maintain some log for software transparency, the whole world could 
could in some sense be agreeing on all the, the published software. And this, this could generalize to other forms of, of software transparency. So for example, Mozilla is looking into binary transparency to make sure that the version of Firefox you install is the one everyone's installing. Um, there's work at UCSD looking at secure package management where you can, for example, uh, secure pa packages you're installing with, uh, with dependencies uh, and so on and potentially even revoke software that you published uh, and know that everybody sees that that software has been revoked when you've discovered a vulnerability. Okay, so a third application is internet payments. Let's say that I wanted to send a dollar to somebody in Nigeria, right? So I'm sitting in the US, I wanna send a dollar to Nigeria, right? Uh, well, this is maybe a fairly complicated situation. In fact, it might involve multiple banks and multiple currency conversions, right? So I might start off uh, in the US, say at bank one with a dollar. My friend in Nigeria is at bank four and wants to receive 300 Naira, which is the, the currency there. And maybe it turns out that bank four has a bank account at bank three, which is in Europe. And there's some bank two that's willing to trade dollars on deposit at bank one for ones on deposit at bank, for euros on deposit at bank three. And so you end up with this, uh, this, this series of essentially uh, currency conversions uh, between money that's stored at different banks. And ideally what you want is to just have this all happen atomically and, and just work. What you don't want to have happen is for your money to get stuck somewhere in the middle, so you're holding euros that some bank that you didn't really want euros or to have deposits at that bank, or worse, you could have double spending where somehow uh, you lose your dollar but the other person doesn't get the Naira either. So this is really where the magic of, of internet level consensus comes into play. If you have internet level consensus, you can do atomic transactions across multiple organizations that don't trust each other and don't even necessarily have any pre-existing relationship, right? Because you can package up this atomic transaction, put it in a global log that the whole world agrees to, and the whole world can either agree that this transaction committed or that it aborted, right? And, uh, and that'll make sure that you don't get left in any weird intermediary state. And this is a technique that's actually in use today by the Stellar Payment Network. Okay, so you want to solve uh, internet level consensus. And the first uh, cut at doing this might be to look at Byzantine agreement, which is a known technique. And Byzantine agreement is a practical solution to consensus when you have a, a closed system of n nodes. And the way this works is you pick some quorum size t, and you see any t nodes out of these n constitute a quorum. And uh, then you can achieve consensus even if some of these nodes are faulty and maybe behave in a malicious way. So, of course, you want to make sure that you never lose track of transactions, right? Which means the system needs to be safe. In order for that to be the case, it has to be uh, the case that any two quorums share at least one non-faulty node, right? So, in this case, if you have a quorum A on the left, quorum B on the right, and, uh, you know, they're going to overlap at two T minus N nodes, so the most failures you can so you can withstand and still guarantee that you won't lose any transactions is going to be 2t minus n minus 1. Now, you might also want to make sure that the system can continue to reach consensus on, on new values. Uh, and for that, you're going to need there to be at least one, one quorum, right? So the most failures you can withstand is n minus t and still be able to enjoy liveness, basically, continue to make progress. Uh, and typically, people configure their systems such that n is 3f plus 1 for some integer f, which is kind of the equilibrium point where you can tolerate up to f failures and still guarantee both safeness and liveness. But the problem is that at the level of the internet, you know, how are we going to enumerate you know, the n nodes of the internet that, that need to agree on, on something, right? The problem is there's no, there's no, politically it's gonna be infeasible to kind of magically bless n privileged actors and say these are the people everybody in the internet should trust. So, so, so that brings us to this new model for consensus, which is called Federated Byzantine Agreement, or FBA. And the idea of FBA is that it's a generalization of Byzantine agreement, uh, so that, uh, but that allows participants to determine quorum composition in a completely decentralized way. And the way this works is that every node V in the system is going to pick one or more uh, quorum slices, which are sets of nodes 
such that V is only going to trust a quorum if that quorum includes at least one of its quorum slices, right? So obviously, if V cares about a particular organization and wants to make sure it's always in sync with that organization, it better put that organization in every single one of its quorum slices. But if V wants to have some fault tolerance and make progress when people are down, it might have multiple options for, for quorum slices. So a federated Byzantine agreement system, or an FBAS, is a set of nodes V and a quorum function Q, where Q of little v is going to be the set of quorum slices chosen by node v. Now, given this definition of an FBAS, we can define a quorum. A quorum is going to be a set of nodes U that contains at least one slice belonging to each of its members. Right? And this is kind of the, the key definition uh, in the whole talk. So I want to zoom in on this uh, with an example. Okay, we'll start with a simple example. This is a four node system. And to keep things simple, each node has a single quorum slice. And I'm going to depict the quorum slices by drawing arrows from each node to the other nodes in its quorum slice. Okay? So if we look at the set of nodes uh, v2, v3, v4, uh, this is a quorum. Why? Because v2, v3, v4 is actually a quorum slice for v2, for v3, and v4. Therefore, that set contains a quorum slice of each of its members. Therefore, it is a quorum. Okay? On the other hand, let's look at the set v1, v2, v3. Right? So this is a slice for v1, but it turns out not to be a quorum because it doesn't include a quorum slice for v2 or v3. In effect, what's happening here is that V1 is saying, well, I'll agree to anything as long as V2 and V3 agree. But V2 and V3 are saying, well, we won't agree to anything unless V4 also agrees. And so therefore, the smallest quorum that actually includes V1 is going to be the set of all nodes in the system, V1, V2, V3, and V4. OK, so here's a more, uh, a little bit more elaborate example, which is a kind of hierarchical tiered uh, quorum slice example. So let's say that there are four nodes that everybody thinks is very important, the systemically important nodes in the system. Those are v1, v2, v3, v4. And those are kind of configured such that each of them believes any three of those top tier nodes constitutes uh, uh, is a valid quorum slice. And then there's a middle tier of nodes v5, 6, 7, and 8 that instead of depending on each other, they depend on the top tier. Each of them, each of these middle tier nodes depends on three out of four top tier nodes. Uh, sorry, two out of four top tier nodes. And on the bottom, say, maybe there's some leaf nodes, v9, v10, that depend on two out of four middle tier nodes. So, uh, so yes, this is hierarchical. But what's kind of nice is that uh, this is hierarchical in the sense that the internet is hierarchical. Yes, there are tier one ISPs, but those are chosen by the market. They're not appointed by any kind of authority. So if we go to the example of a payment network, maybe the top tier nodes are actually the top four retail banks in the US. Right? But this is something that the market can decide for itself. And maybe. Maybe nodes V7 and V8, they say, you know what? We recognize these are big banks and we have to deal with them, but we don't trust the big banks. So we're going to extend our quorum slices to say, not only do we want to hear agreement from two out of these four big banks, we also want to hear agreement from one out of these three nonprofits whose incentives are, are very different from those of the banks. And the nonprofits here would be Stellar, the EFF, and the ACLU, say. And then these nonprofits depend on two out of three of each other. right? So now let's look at how this uh, configuration can actually protect V7 and V8. Suppose that Citibank comes along and goes to V7 and says, hey, V7, here's a billion dollars on deposit at Chase Bank that we're willing to give you in exchange for a billion dollars worth of goods. And you know, three of the big banks sign off on this. Two of, the, uh, two of these nonprofits do. So V7 says, OK, here's a billion dollars worth of goods. You can walk out the door with, with all these goods. Right? Meanwhile, it turns out their paranoia was well-founded. Citibank turns around and goes to two other big banks, and they collude to try to reverse this transaction. And then they want to spend that same billion dollars to V8 and get a second billion dollars worth of goods from V8. Well, V8 is going to say, OK, I see three big uh, banks are signing off on this, but I need one of these nonprofits to agree as well. And so 
Stellar and the EFF aren't going to agree because they're not going to reverse the, the previous spend of that billion dollars. Maybe the SCLU will. But the, the problem is that the ACLU uh, depends on two out of these three nonprofits. So the ACLU is going to say, well, I'm not going to agree to this unless you know, EFF or Stellar does. And those nodes aren't. Therefore, the ACLU won't agree. Therefore, V8 will never ex accept this transaction. Therefore, V8 was actually protected in this system. OK, so, uh, so, that's the, so, so this is kind of the model. So the next question is, how, when can you actually guarantee safety and liveness in the system? In a sense, where should we set the goalposts for a protocol? And uh, the answer is that, uh, you know, like in regular Byzantine agreement, any two quorums have to share a non-faulty node. So in this system, you have a quorum on the left, a quorum on the right, and they overlap at V7. That's all well and good, unless it turns out that V7 is evil, because then V7 can tell one thing to the nodes on the left and something else to the nodes on the right. So basically, if you take all the misbehaving nodes in the system and you kind of conceptually delete them from everybody's quorum slices, uh, you'll see that what you're left with is a system in which the quorums do not overlap, right? So basically, if you, if you delete all the bad nodes and the quorums don't overlap, then you can't guarantee safety in the system. And for liveness, uh, same as business, centralized Byzantine agreement, you just need a full uh, a quorum of, of, of non-faulty nodes, right? In this case, if V1, V2, V3 are non-faulty, but V7 is faulty, well, then you can't guarantee liveness because V1, V2, V3 are going to be waiting for V7 that, that might not answer. OK. So, uh, so I have a, a, a protocol construction of FBA. It's called the Stellar Consensus Protocol. And it's in production use today by the Stellar Payment Network. And this thing is coming to consensus about every five seconds, right? The, all these nodes are, are agreeing on something. It's running on about 20 nodes right now. Um, and the, the Stellar Consensus Protocol it guarantees safety if every two quorums sh uh, share an honest node, which is kind of optimal in the sense that if, if the protocol ever diverges, then no protocol could have guaranteed safety. And it also guarantees that you won't get stuck as long as there's one well-behaving quorum, which is kind of the best you can do because there's a fundamental impossibility result in distributed systems that a fault-tolerant, safe consensus algorithm can't guarantee termination. The best you can hope for is that it terminates in practice. The core idea in SCP is this idea of federated voting. And that is that nodes vote to commit or abort statements, but the, vote, the signed vote messages include their quorum slices. And so then you can dynamically discover quorums as you're assembling votes. So at a very high level, the way the SCP protocol works is that you have uh, these uh, two phases. In the first phase, all these nodes are nominating values, right? So here we see V1 nominating TX1, TX2, V2 maybe nominating TX3. And then nodes, they kind of propagate these nominated values to one another. And eventually, they converge on a set of uh, nominated values. Um, and then they can combine these values in a deterministic way. So in Stellar, for example, we, uh, we combine the, we take the union of the sets of transactions and the max of some timestamp. You could also just hash everything and pick the value with the, with the lowest hash, for example, um, as long as it's deterministic, right? So this is almost good enough to solve ILC. The problem is that it's uh, because of this impossibility result I mentioned on the last slide, you never know when the protocol is actually converged. So you have to guess that the protocol is converged and hope that you're right. And so that's why we feed the output of the first phase into a second phase, which is a lot like Byzantine Paxos. And, uh, and that means that essentially, uh, even if the first phase didn't quite work out, the second phase guarantees that you'll have safety, that you won't diverge, and that you'll never get stuck. You'll be able to recover even if you just thought different sets of values were nominated. OK, so if you're, uh, if you're interested in this, there's a white paper describing the protocol. There's also uh, a mailing list at the IETF if you think you might have a use for internet level consensus and want some kind of standardized mechanism, I would invite you to join the mailing list. Uh, and, uh, and finally, I'll uh, leave you with a link to the Stellar Development Foundation, which is the, the payment network based on this protocol, which is kind of how this all got started. OK, thanks.